You know, one thing about Blessed Hope Chapel, we had a, a couple uh, visit last week. In fact, there they are. Uh, no, not point you guys out, but I guess I just did. <laughs> just really beautiful couple love Jesus, and they, they're visiting us for the valley last week, and they said, you know, we ended up finding your church. We saw some of your stuff on YouTube, and then we saw your church. Was that right? Saw some stuff on YouTube? Okay. Then they uh, said, we checked out. We said, wow, the church is right there in Simi Valley, and we checked out the, the statement of faith, and we loved your statement of faith because it had certain characteristics they were looking for, like, you, you know, warning, even that we the church warns the flock, you know, and what have you, and they say, we don't usually see that in statements of faith, and that's what we really feel is needed, you know, in, in churches. And, and I thought it's interesting because, you know, I almost take for granted because that's what the New Testament church was about. And when you hear that, you're like, that's interesting that, you know, that is missing in so many statements of faith. And, and I'm sure many churches don't have that in their statement of faith, but still exercise warning and what have you appropriately, but that signify to them, hey, this church is on the right track, you know, this is the goal that they should have. And I thought it was interesting because uh, there are certain scriptures that mean a lot to me as far as what the, our church is called to. See, we didn't try to make up a new vision for what the church should be. We said, okay, God, what's your vision for the church? And one of my favorite passages in the book of Acts says specifically, it summarizes, as I mentioned, in snapshot form what the church is supposed to be and what we're supposed to look like and how we're supposed to be exercising. It shows us what the New Testament church was like. And it says in the book of Acts chapter 2, it says that, that and they co- were continuing to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, okay, and to fellowship. Do we have the apostles' teaching? Do we continue with that at Blessed Hope? Amen. And to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Do we break bread together? The Lord's Supper, uh, communion, also, you know, fellowshipping together. Sometimes we break bread too much, you know, Uh, (laughs) trying to stay on that treadmill. And then the next thing it mentions, and prayer. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I thought, wow, isn't the church, wasn't the early church so simplified? Because the simple things that God's called us to are the most important things, are the best things. And these are the ingredients of a vibrant church. You know, I can look around right now, and it's great to see most of the people from, you know, first and second service together. I know we're missing a lot of people today still, but in one service, and to see just, I could look around and I just see a lot of glowing faces, a lot of people that love Jesus. And I believe that's a result of doing what we're called to do in the New Testament church. We're far from perfect, but they've given us a model. Now, not every New Testament church is a model. Sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's so good because, you know, we want to be like the New Testament church. And I, sometimes I'll say, which one, you know? The Corinthians were divided. They, some of them were denying the resurrection. They were putting up with a guy that was having relations with his stepmother. I mean, all kinds of bizarre things. Which early church? Well, if you're talking about wanting to be like the early church, it's when it first started. That's what we want to emulate. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's go to that passage, that verse, and the passage that surrounds it. And let's just, you know, get our priorities right, get focused, and, and see what we're called to be. And I think this is such a, a beautiful passage and so instructive to us. You'll notice that Blessed Hope, we have a lot of things going on, but the things we typically have going on are, are all designed to be Christ-centered, you see, and not a bunch of programs that kind of dilute what is mainly supposed to be going on. The plain things are the main things. The main things are the plain things in Scripture. And chapter 2, verse 42 says, they were continually devoting themselves Continually, it was habitual, devoting. It has the idea of just, you know, strong determination and adherence to something. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And this is such an important concept that now when we think of the apostles' teaching, I mean, here we have, keep in mind in verse 42, God's prescription for proper church growth. When I talk about church growth, church growth is not seeing how big your church can get. Church growth is seeing how healthy your church can grow together as God adds the numbers. It's not about getting numbers yourselves. And you can have a church of a couple thousand, but if you're compromising the gospel to do that, it's really not church growth. It's human growth. It's, it's man-centered growth. And, and we want to make sure that our growth is biblical, according to the scriptures. Now, it's interesting because when we look at this, uh, we see the marks of a, of a New Testament church, and, 
And basically, chapter 2, verse 42, is a summary statement of verses 43 through 47, which unpacks what Luke has given to us about the early church who traveled with the Apostle Paul throughout the book of Acts, Luke did. And he gives us, he unpacks verse 42 and verses 43 through verses 47. Let's look at that briefly. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were ta uh, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's a mouthful. There was a lot going on, a lot to be excited about. And you'll keep in mind, the early church turned the world upside down. I mean, this was a small band of disciples that started at about 120 in the upper room. After Jesus had ascended, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Uh, the church just exploded. And throughout the, the globe, so many people came to Christ and are still coming to Christ by the hundreds of millions now. And this was a prophecy that Jesus has stated that I will build my church. He's the one that builds his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's an awesome truth. The gates of hell have not prevailed against the church. In fact, oftentimes when the church is most persecuted is when it endures and becomes most strengthened and grows in spectacular and beautiful ways. So it's awesome to know that God is on the throne no matter what happens, whether Islam continues to encroach upon our country and throughout the world, uh, there's prophecies to be fulfilled. And ultimately, Jesus' church will stand until he comes back and receives them to himself at his second coming. Now, it's important to understand that as we look at this passage, oftentimes the church doesn't look at all what we're, like what we're reading here. I mean, the very first verse, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So many churches today, especially many mainline denominations, uh, many Episcopalian, United Methodist, Presbyterian USA, have so diverged from apostolic teaching. Not all those churches within those denominations, but many of those churches have, you know, uh, abortion is no longer an issue. Killing babies is no longer an issue uh, to many people. Homosexual uh, marriage and relationships is not an issue. Uh, and not just those denominations, even in evangelical churches, so-called evangelical churches, with the rise of the emerging church, the apostles' doctrine is not important anymore. You have the doctrine of Balaam, of false teaching coming in where you can have adherence with other religions that are totally contrary and diametrically opposed to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is very, very serious. And, and the early church stayed on course because they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What's the apostles' teaching? The apostles' teaching is basically what we read in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, the rest of the epistles that were written uh, by apostles and disciples and what have you, uh, emphasizing the apostles' teaching, the teachings that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you go through the book of Acts, in which we will, we'll see some of the apostles' teachings summed up in various verses. But it's important to understand one of the things that was central, the, the thing that was central to the apostles' teaching, was, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death for our sins, his burial, his resurrection, you see. And it's interesting because uh, this teaching is what brought so many to Christ. In fact, if you look at verse 43, it says, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. There was a, a, a fear, comes right after the apostles teaching these other things, that came upon a sense of awe as to who God was at the apostles teaching. There was a reverence for God. And it's interesting because if you back up a few verses You'll see them asking uh, in verse 37 after Peter preached the Pentecost sermon. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? You see, when the apostles preached the gospel, they gave them, uh, they, they let them know. The point of man wants to die after this, the judgment. And God is a, the almighty God and, and he is to be feared. And, and we need to be saved from his wrath because of our rebellion and and they turned to, to Peter and they said, the apostles, what, what shall we do to be saved? You see, and they were called to believe in the gospel. 
and follow through. And he goes on to say, be baptized and what have you, and that would be the evidence of their faith. And it's so important that we understand the centrality of what they preached was the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified. And there was a sense of awe in the early church because of the preaching of the apostles. The apostles' teaching is basically the teaching of Jesus Christ, his person, his ministry, who he is, you know, his prophetic teachings and what have you, and all based on the Old Testament prophecies and, and fulfilled in Christ with the church of the mystery revealed in the new covenant. And it's interesting because Jesus said to his apostles that, you know, after he descended, he said he would send his Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit would bring them into remembrance of the things that he taught. You know, of course, they'd remember a lot of things he taught, but the Holy Spirit would crystallize in their minds, I mean, vividly, word for word often, you know, what uh, Jesus had said to them and so forth and, and what have you. And in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said to go into all the world, right? Teaching, you know, baptizing them and teaching all nations what? To observe all the things that I've commanded you. So the apostles' teaching is to us, and their disciples, and their disciples, and what have you, to observe the teachings of Jesus Christ. So it's Christ-centered teaching. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, Paul warns about those false teachers who do not hold to the teachings, the sound teachings, he says, of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, a lot of times, so sometimes people read the New Testament, they'll say, oh, this is Paul. They'll call it Pauline, you see. Oh, this is, this is Peter. And they don't see the unity, they don't understand they haven't had the opening of their eyes by the Spirit of God to see that this is the Word of God. Paul said, you know, he, he talked about the words that I share. He says, those who disobey these words, 1 Corinthians 14, near the end, are not disobeying man, but disobeying God, the very Word of God. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3.15, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3.15 and 16, he talked about how, you know, that the false teachers distort uh, the Word of God and they distort Paul's teachings as they do the other scriptures. You see, the New Testament was understood to be the very word of God. Even the revelation of John is not the revelation of John. If you go to the book of Revelation, a lot of your headings will say the revelation of John. But verse 1 tells us who the revelation is from. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And goes on to talk about he sent to the seven churches and what have you. And you've got to stop there because I think I've memorized, I've got a lot of it forgotten, I'm sure, verse 10, 11 chapters of Revelation. But it starts off very strong, very strong, the revelation of, and very clear, of Jesus Christ, you see. So we're talking about the very Word of God. The Apostles' teaching is actually God's Word transmitted through faithful men. And even the life of Christ is emulated so often in the Apostles. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now, the Bible warns that there would be a departure from the apostolic teaching. In fact, when you hear that, you hear the name of some churches, it's just, you know, the apostolic church of Jesus Christ. That's actually a pretty cool name. You know, if a church has that name, the apost then what they're saying is they're saying that our teaching is what? Apostolic. That we're going by the New Testament teaching, the apostolic teaching of the church of Jesus Christ. So we have apostolic. What that church is trying to communicate is saying, hey, we follow the apostles' teaching. We follow the teachings of the New Testament and their and the understanding of the apostles and Jesus of the Old Testament and what have you. And Now, that doesn't mean every church that says apostolic on it is apostolic. You have to always test what's being preached to make sure it's apostolic. But we are a church that is apostolic. We go by the apostolic teaching, the teachings of the apostles. Now, it's important to understand that there has been a departure because the Bible says, preach the word, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all what? Long-suffering and doctrine. Doctrine teaching are the same thing. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, you hear that? But after their own lust, they'll heap themselves teachers who will tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. So we've been warned that there would be an apostasy where many people, it says in that passage, would flock to false teachers because it would be entertainment. It would be, hey, you know, and they'd go home talking about the pastor or the programs rather than Jesus, you know? And I want you going home talking about Jesus, amen? And, not, and, and what's happened is, what's gone on, and it's so sad, is now, you know, you have, you know, 
churches that are pro-abortion and pro-gay marriage and all these things, and they departed from the apostolic teaching. They departed from the apostolic teaching. And they would look at a church like us and say, you know what, you guys are 20 years behind the times. But you know what, I don't want to be 20 years behind the time. I want to be 2,000 years behind the times. Amen? I want to be like the early church. In fact, the Bible warns that these things would come. And the scripture is saying in the book of Proverbs, watch out for those who are given to change. Come on, changing, trying to change God's truth, calling good evil and evil good and what have you. And the Bible says, seek out the old paths. Beautiful verse. I want to see what God has to say, you know. Uh, I'm, I, I'm only progressive when it comes to methodology. You know, I mean, John Wesley, when he started riding horses and started sending his ministers on horses all over the place in England, I mean, England and, and much of the world in certain areas, America was turned upside down by the Wesleyan revival. Methodism came out of that, and it was pretty sound for quite a while, and there's still many sound Methodist churches, but some have fallen off the path. But John Wesley was very... Uh, Methodism comes from his methods, you see, and he was progressive in his methodology. And we need to be progressive. In fact, we need to say, okay, where are people at? How can we reach them? We could reach people through the internet. We could reach people in all kinds of ways today that we couldn't reach them so many years ago. But we're not progressive when it comes to our theology. Amen? We're conservative when it comes to our theology because this is a message that the Bible says was once for all delivered to the saints. And we're called to earnestly uh, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So we do not accept any change of Jesus' message because it ceases to be his message and becomes some mere man's message or worse, a doctrine of demons. As the Bible says in the last days, uh, there would be seducing spirits and doctrines of demons and, and some would depart from the faith. And we're in that period of time now. So it's important that we adhere to the apostolic teaching in fact, there's many verses that, that speak to this issue. In, in Titus, it says, holding fast, in chapter 1, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able, this is a qualification for an elder, guys, in Titus, chapter 1. He must what? Be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and confute the impo impostors. Did you realize that that's a qualification for an elder? That he has to be able to refute false teaching and imposters? Do you realize that often is not the qualifications in many people's minds for an elder? 1 Timothy 4, 6 says, Paul to Timothy, If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. Verse 11 says, These things command and teach. Verse 13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading and exhortation to doctrine. Verse 16 of chapter 4 says, Take heed unto yourself and to your doctrine. Continue in them, and in so doing you will save yourself and those who hear you. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word. I mentioned that one already, in season, out of season. It's so important as a fellowship that we are devoted to sound doctrine. You see, God wants our minds. He wants our minds to be filled with his truth so we are not deceived by Satan, who is the father of lies. In fact, we're told in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you know, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the what? Renewing of our minds. That happens through the apostles' teachings, the word of God, renewing our minds. In fact, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge. Catch that? Put on the new man. We're all called that is renewed in knowledge. What knowledge? The knowledge of God. The knowledge of his word. Amen? Praise God. Good to see you, Jim. Praying for you, bro. Praise God, man. 1 Peter uh, 1.13 says, Where, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind. The loins of your mind. Hosea says, My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. You see? So the apostles' teaching, uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ are critical if we're not to be destroyed. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. If we don't know the truth, truth is our foundation. Jesus talked about the two different men. One built his, his life on the sand, his house, so to speak, which was a picture of his life. And then that's a, not a good foundation. Then when the storms came, the hail and the wind, bam, Jesus said, great was his fall. But then he said, the man who built his life on the rock, when the storms came, his house stood. And he said, the man the wise man who built his life or his house in the rock is likened to the one who builds his life on my words. If you don't build your life on the words of Christ 
and the apostolic teaching, which is Christ-centered, you are going to fall. Your household is going to fall. And there are so many churches that are already fallen. And they fill pews and what have you, but they don't focus on Jesus Christ. You know? They focus on the latest list that's given to them by popular media or what have you. You know? And it's, it's actually very, very tragic. So it's critical that we are following the apostolic teaching. In fact, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And when you get there, look at verse 2. Paul writes to Timothy, a young pastor slash evangelist, uh, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you catch that? Things that you've heard from me, you entrust to faithful men who will be able to entrust them to others. So the apostolic teaching was supposed to be passed down, and we have it here, the Word of God. And any traditions have to be tested by the Word of God. Amen? So there are many who will say, oh, this was an apostolic teaching, but it's just not in the Bible. Well, if it contradicts Scripture, it's not an apostolic teaching. God is not the author of confusion. Amen? In fact, look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourself, what? A proof to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately what amen. handling the word of truth amen the bible says the word of god is a sword of the spirit when jesus defeated satan when he's being tempted he, three different times he said it is written he accurately handled the word of truth the sword of the spirit yet we're called to pass on the apostolic teaching and we're called to study to show ourselves approved we're supposed to be students of the word of god amen and i hope to god i hope to god that that you are a student of the Word of God. I hope to God that you test what I'm saying. I tell you to test everybody, including me, especially me. If I'm your pastor, you got to test me and make sure what I'm saying is in accordance with the Word of God. And it's so important because even in Paul was tested by the Scripture. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, he was preaching the gospel. And it says, the, the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica. Because they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, but tested what Paul said daily by searching the scriptures. That time they had only the Old Testament scriptures. So they had to make sure that Jesus was Messiah. And they tested the apostle Paul. So any pastor who says, you know, you can't scrutinize my teaching, that's bad news. You know, that's Jim Jones-like. You need to make sure that I'm following the word of God. Amen? When I share. It's important. And it's important whenever you hear radio teaching or uh, teaching on television, you've got to be especially careful of television teaching, okay? Because a lot of it is man-focused and not Christ-centered and, and very, very deceptive. Not all of it, but a great deal of it, you see. So it's important to test everybody, including your pastor. And when you're driving down the street and you hear a radio preacher, you don't just accept what he says. You have to say, is that what the Scripture says? And if he quotes one verse, or I quote one verse, is that the context of what the Scripture's saying? You see, you always have to test everything. We want to be, be like the Bereans, amen? Be like the Bereans. There's our uh, wonderful men of God to emulate. Uh, look at chapter 3, verse 15. And from childhood, Paul says to Timothy, you have known the what? Sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So we need to be students to study ourselves, show ourselves approved and grow in our salvation and soak up the word of God. And how can you even test what somebody says about the word of God if you're not reading the word of God yourself? I want to encourage each person here at Blessed Hope Chapel, make sure that you're in the scripture every day. That's biblical. We're supposed to meditate not just every day, but the Bible says we're supposed to meditate on Scripture day and what? Night. You're working out, have a Scripture there. Especially if you go to one of these gyms, okay? Because there's a lot of music that's, you know, very unholy. There's a lot of people that aren't dressed so hot. I haven't been to a gym in years. I, I, you know, if I exercise, I try to do it at home, or usually I go up in the mountains or hills and, and, and hike or run or walk. And, and, but you know what I always try to do? 
I try to bring scripture with me. I try to memorize, just a scripture to memorize, to think about, to meditate. When I go to bed at night, I, I, I bring a scripture with me. And I'll start memorizing, working on a scripture to memorize. If you have a hard time sleeping, that's a great thing to do. Do you know that? Just start quoting scripture because the devil will try to put you to sleep as fast as possible. Okay? I'll tell you what, man. That works. I thought you want the devil to put you to sleep, but you, you're going to sleep with the scripture in your heart. You're waking up with it. You have a little thing written next to it. Scripture, you, you can buy, you can write down. I just write down scriptures, man, by bedside, you know. I take them with me hiking. And, well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to do that. Wrong. We're all called to what? Meditate on his word day and night. Young man, you are strong because the word of God is in you and you have overcome the evil one. First John, how can a young man keep his way pure? But by keeping it according to the word. Young men, young women, you want to be pure, man. You need to have the word of God in your heart. Amen. That's so critical. So we want, to, we want to be students of the word. We want to meditate on the word. Amen. Are you doing that? If you're not, right now in your heart, say, wow, I want to be continually devoted like the early church to the apostles' teaching. Amen. Make a note. Write it on your hand even. And don't erase it from your hand until you start practicing this. Or, or write it down somewhere in your heart. Say, you know what? I want to make sure I always have scripture in my heart. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all your needs will be met, Jesus said. That's the recipe also for biblical prosperity. I'm not talking about worldly prosperity, but the scriptures tell us how to be strong and courageous and prosperous, and it talks about meditating on his word again. So if you want to have a prosperous life, spiritually speaking, put God and his word first. And if you don't want to, just neglect those things. And sure enough, troubles will come into your life because you're not building your life on his word. That'll be too hard to overcome outside of the power of his word. Amen? Now, let's go back to the book of uh, Acts, and I want to show you a few places where it shows, it sums up what the apostles were teaching. Acts chapter 11. I already pointed out to you in chapter 2, they were, their focal point was uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, it's interesting. In fact, you know what I should probably do is go back to Acts 5 first. Verse 41 and 42. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were just flogged, whipped, backs opened up like hamburger because of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, kicked out of a city, but they continued to preach. And verse 42 says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching what? Jesus as the Christ. That's our main, our main teaching, the apostolic teaching, and what we're called to teach. Amen? That, that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. He's the Savior of the world. And then you emphasize adherence to that teaching. In fact, we see in the book of Acts, they emphasize adherence to the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, perseverance through persecution, endurance in the faith. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 21. It says... And the hand of the Lord was with them, and large numbers who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to what? Encourage them all with what? Resolute heart to what? To remain true to the Lord. You know why I emphasize so much? to remain true to Jesus. Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. It's because that was the apostolic way. That sums up. They, 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 that was part of their teaching, to remain true to Jesus. And you might, I might sound like a broken record to you, but in the midst of a time when Paul, Paul and Jesus, the apostles, said there would be a falling away, we need that teaching more than ever. In fact, go to the next chapter. Or we'll go to chapter 13. Chapter 13. Go to verse 43. And in the middle of the verse, it talks about God-fearing proselytes, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to what? Verse 43 of chapter 13. We're urging them at the end to what? Continue in the grace of God. It sums up the teaching of the apostles. The gospel of Jesus Christ, and they continue in the teaching of God's word. Look at chapter 14, verse 22. Chapter 14, verse 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Now, this is showing when they go to various churches. In fact, look at verse 21, context. 
after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to what? Continue the faith and saying, through what? Many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. They'd warn them about coming tribulation and that you have to go through tribulation to enter the kingdom of God and they would urge them to continue in the faith. Those are three different verses that sum up a lot of the emphasis of the apostles and what they emphasized. And I'm letting you know that as a, as a, a blessed hope, there is strong emphasis. The gospel of Jesus Christ, who Jesus is, adherence to him to the end. Amen? Even through tribulation. So we seek to be a New Testament church. And you know what? I didn't just wake up one day and say, this is what I'm going to preach. I've searched the scriptures. I've been in the Word since I was like, you know, 18 years old, came to Jesus Christ, man, and have seen and followed the model of what we're called to do. And the same things God puts on my heart in prayer confirm over and over again what I see in scripture. And actually, scripture needs to confirm what's given to you in prayer. But it's to emphasize the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and sincere determined perseverance in the truths of the gospel. Amen? So it's critical that we understand this. Now back to Acts chapter 2. Are you all with me? Praise God. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's go back to that. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. What's next on the list? First mark of a New Testament church was a, a continual devotion to the apostles' teaching. But next was and to what? Fellowship. You notice the apostles' teaching is first because the teachings of the Word of God are foundational to everything else. The content of who Jesus is and what have you is the foundation. But next, and to what? Fellowship. It's because of the content of the teaching of God's Word and adherence to the Word of God that people came together in fellowship. Now, you have to get the picture here. I mean, this church that had just basically started uh, on the day of Pentecost. And, you know, some would have it started earlier, and it's possible that in God's mind, you know, when Jesus was calling the disciples, that was the first group of the ecclesia. So you could say that was a church in germination. That's, that's more how I lean, but the, the public uh, display of who the church was is here on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. You have to understand that all kinds of people just came to Christ. There were 120 disciples in the upper room Jesus had ascended. He said, wait there and tarry until the Holy Spirit comes upon you in power. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Holy Spirit came upon them with power. And, and, they, and, and it was awesome because they began to share the word of God. Uh, actually, Peter began to actually express the gospel because on the day of Pentecost was a feast day. And Often on feast days, guess how? There's a few feast days a year, and there would be about a million people in Jerusalem visiting from all over the world. Jews and proselytes, God-fearing Gentiles that would come to worship Yahweh. And the day of Pentecost was the day of harvest, the perfect day for God to bring in, because those feasts in the Old Testament were pictures of the reality that was in Christ, and it was the day of harvest for the church. And 3,000 souls came to God that day on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls souls. So church grew from 120 to 3,120 in one day. Biggest baptism service in history right after people got saved. And there was a ton of water there because when, because of the Feast of Pentecost, Israel, Jerusalem specifically, was transformed into a place of hospitality where they knew all these pilgrims would come from all over the place. And what's amazing is you have people mentioned in Acts chapter 1 from Cappadocia, from uh, Crete, from from Egypt, from Arabia, different people that came from everywhere, and people heard the gospel and came to Christ. You have people with all kinds of backgrounds, but guess what they have now? They have fellowship. They have fellowship. The Greek word translated fellowship here is koinonia. Koinonia. It's a beautiful Greek word, and it speaks of having things in common. Well, guess what? All these people from diverse backgrounds, they came to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. They were pierced to the heart. They're seeing these radical miracles done by the apostles uh, throughout the book of Acts. People were just coming to Christ in droves, and the world was being turned upside down. And guess what? People from all these different backgrounds now had koinonia, things in common, and were one like people could never see people united. And I love it because we have such sweet fellowship in koinonia right here at Blessed Hope. 
people from all kinds of different backgrounds, from different uh, uh, countries, continents, different you know, states, uh, and what have you. And there's such sweet, sweet fellowship and sweet koinonia. And I love it because we have these things in common. We have the same Lord, amen? We have the same guide to our lives, the same word of God, amen? We have the same destiny. We share the same victories. We struggle with the same, uh, you know, the, the same things that we have to overcome. And, and we, we pray together. And, and, and it's, it's absolutely, we have the same spirit, amen? It's absolutely beautiful. You don't get this anywhere other than true unity, other than the church of Christ, those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ the Christian church, those who truly follow Jesus Christ. And it is quite an amazing thing. Fellowship is essential for you to be strong in the Lord. Otherwise, you are just going to be a whipping boy of the enemy. You know that? You're just going to be a whipping boy. You're going to be in trouble. There's no Lone Ranger Christians. You don't read about them in the Bible. In fact, Satan would love to get you out of fellowship because I mean, he's compared to a lion. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. How, does, how do lions seek to devour? They seek to get the weak one away from the herd, right? And, and steer him astray and then go after him and pounce on him and devour them. It's important that we stay with our shepherd together, amen? We are no match for the enemy. He could just wipe us out in a millisecond. It's critical, in fact, do you know what? I mean, we're at war, and there was a survey done a few years back on POWs as to what was their greatest challenge, what was uh, the greatest heartbreak that they had uh, gone through while they were in confinement. And you know, was it torture? No. Torture was horrible for many of them. But that wasn't the main thing on the list. Was it brainwashing, propaganda? No. You know what it was? by far and away isolation. When they were isolated from their com comrades, that's what made them break the easiest, give in to the enemy the easiest. And, and Satan knows that that's true, so he wants to isolate you from fellowship. That's why the Bible says that we are not to forsake the fellowshipping of ourselves together in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, but that we're to get together all the more as we see the day of Christ approaching. Do you believe Christ's second coming is approaching and getting closer? Okay, well, we're supposed to get together all the more as his coming nears. Amen? I think it's interesting because the verse that says not to forsake the fellowshipping of yourselves together, but get together all the more as you see the day of Christ approaching, is the same verse right before that it warns about falling away. And then in Hebrews 10, 26, the verse after it, it verse 26 through 31, is the strongest passage in the Bible, in my opinion, against falling away from God. And in Hebrews chapter Three, verse 13, it says we're supposed to encourage each one another day after day. Not just on the first day of the week. We're supposed to be in contact with other believers every day. You know? And it said, and what's heavy is chapter 3, verse 12, the verse before that, it warns about falling away from the living God by the deceitfulness of sin and our hearts being hardened. The verse right after that verse, right after verse 13, which says to encourage each other day after day, the verse after it says, and we are Christ, if we, we belong to Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our confession steadfast to the end. I find it fascinating that two of the most important verses on fellowshipping and continuing in the faith and encouraging us to encourage one another are sandwiched between other verses that warn about falling away. And when you start to stand aloof from other believers and get some kind of attitude or, or whatever, or Satan gets you in sin and you just don't want to be around believers, that's the worst case scenario. Fall on your face, say, God, have mercy on me. Call a brother or sister and say, pray for me. I'm struggling. Amen? We need each other. It's when Peter started to stand aloof from the other apostles and said, ah, they might all deny you, but I will never deny you. Remember that? Paul says, take heed when you stand, lest you fall. Peter wasn't taking heed. He was thinking too highly of himself. And he put himself, he separated himself from the fellowship in some way. And he had a huge fall. He had a huge fall. Praise God. Jesus said, I pray that your faith will not fail. And ultimately, Peter's faith did not fail. But God, God's you know, prayers of Christ helped uh, preserve us, but also, guess what? The Word of God preserves us. It says, by your word, your servants are warned, and that's how we're preserved. So it's important to adhere to the Word, and it's important to be in fellowship. Amen? It's critical to be in fellowship. Now, I think it's an, an interesting because the meaning of fellowship is unpacked in verses that follow 
verse 42. And it's interesting because when we think of fellowship, a lot of times as believers, we think of prayer, we think of eating together, and those are both mentioned in this list, breaking bread. But the first thing he mentions is not, uh, well, the first thing he goes into here is verses 44 and 45 are interesting. And all those who had believed were what? Together. And had what? All, all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, man, then it gets into the breaking of bread and what have you. That's pretty powerful. Now, there's a lot of disagreement as to the meaning of these verses because these verses are actually threatening sometimes to our lifestyles, sometimes to our savings, if you have a savings account. Wow, I'm expected to, to give to the poor brethren and what have you. And, and they had all things in common. And some say, hey, that's like early communism, you see. But it's totally not early communism. And I believe there are, personally, my personal conviction, as I read this scripture, when I read this scripture, I think there are two extremes. There's one extreme that takes this passage and wrests it from its context. The Bible warns about those who rest the scriptures. And it uses the Greek word for the rack when you'd be twisted to say something that you didn't want to say. And they twist the scriptures to say something they want to say. And they say that this merits the communistic system. That's a lie that's not supported in, in the scripture here. But there are others who say, well, since it doesn't support the communistic system, it has no relevance, it was an experiment by the early church, and we need not even really pay attention to those verses. Because they'll point out that, hey, this happened, and 20 years later, we read later in the book of Acts, the church in Jerusalem was still very poor, and it was a kind of a failed system. And what they're, what they're not understanding is it's not a system. There was no communism being preached here. But there was a, well, it's interesting because after he mentions fellowship, koinonia, okay, he says they had all things in common, koina, root from the same root word from koinonia. I do believe Luke, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is drawing a connection between koinonia and koina, sharing, having things in common, and sharing with each other. In fact, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, he says, charge those who are rich in this world to share with those who are in need. So that's a biblical principle. But we have to be careful here because it was not, it was not compulsory sharing. It wasn't as though everybody took all their stuff and put it into a big pot and some governing body of the church, you know, said, everybody just strip yourself and we're going to be in a commune together of everything and like, you know, uh, and we're just going to put everything together and everybody's going to dress in the same color suit and everything else and you're going to all have a certain number and we're just going to, we're going to distribute what we feel. No, it was people that voluntarily, see, in communism, it's not voluntary, is it? You know? It was people who voluntarily, out of their heart, sought God and, and, and used their, if they were somewhat well-to-do, would help those who are in need. Also, keep in mind the context. This is the day of Pentecost and there are what? A million people visiting, and on the day of Pentecost, a million people would visit for the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Guess what? Everybody would share their homes. Everybody would share food and water with the pilgrims and show incredible hospitality for the most part. Well, guess what the church was doing? There was 3,000 new converts from people from all over the place who wanted to stay and hear the teachings of the apostles and get rooted and grounded in Jesus. Amen? Do you understand? So they saw if these young babes are going to grow in Christ... It says, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And they're going to be under the apostles' teaching. They were going to minister to these new converts. They were going to help them and, and encourage them. So it's a special situation to where you had 3,000 brand new converts. Always remember the context, especially as our nation becomes more and more socialistic, you know. And this scripture will be wrested out of context. The context is 3,000 new converts from far distances away, people that are poor, that people need help, and Christian love, Amen. People saying, hey, I have a lot. I can sell this and actually help this brother out. Or you know what? Well, I have a guest house over here. This person can have the guest house for a while or even have it. Who knows what happened exactly? But there, were a lot, there was a lot of giving, voluntary giving. Amen? Voluntary giving. In fact, you know how we know for sure it was voluntary and it wasn't under compulsion? Remember when Ananias and Sapphira had said that, hey, we sold our land for such and such a price and they lied about it? Look at Acts chapter 5. Verse 4, Peter says to Ananias, while it remained unsold, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your what? Your own. 
And after it was sold, was it not under your what? Control. Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The issue was not whether he was going to give the money for his land to the church. The issue was lying about what was going on. And the church was one in accord, and God was keeping the purity of the church, especially early on. It was so important that he wasn't going to allow uh, uh, this radical disruption. And boom, Ananias fell dead. Then Sapphira came with the same life she fell dead. But what does Peter say? It was your own land under your control, your power. Even when you sold it, the money was yours. It wasn't as though everything belonged to everybody. Do you understand? But there were certain believers who were pretty well to do that were able to give up certain things to help other believers, which is New Testament teaching, which is the teaching of Jesus Christ. But that is up to each individual before God. How dare I say to this person over here or this person over there, you need to give this to this person. You need to give that to that person. You know, that's what the government tries to do, you know. That's really theft. If it's not voluntary, it's theft. It really is. So we need to keep things in biblical perspective. Acts chapter 5 verse 4 shows you that there was not a communistic system. What it was was voluntary people seeing the needs of others. You know, and James says if we see our brother in need and we shut up the bowels of mercy, you know, that's a serious issue. He says, how do we have the love of God? First John uh, says that as well. However, at the same time, we dare not explain the passage away, right? And miss, because it might be uncomfortable to our lifestyle or what have you, the teaching here. Luke is bringing those two words, koinonia and koina, together to show that the, the early church was so in love with God, so in awe of him, that people and God mattered more to them than possessions. And that's how it should be for us. Amen? We dare not sidestep that. God and being in awe of him and those who are in awe of God, which is what the scriptures say here, love him and love people, and people are more important to them than temporal possessions because people are eternal in these. Jesus didn't die for possessions. He died for souls. Amen? So it's important to understand this. In fact, Luke has a special emphasis throughout his gospel. Luke wrote the book of Acts. He also wrote the, wrote the gospel of Luke. He has a special emphasis on making sure that our priorities are right with regard to our material possessions. Luke is, alone tells a story about the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Okay? Luke also is the one who told, alone told the parable about the rich barn builder. He's the one who told that in Acts chapter 12. I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 12. He's the one that talked about those who didn't come to Jesus because they had fields and cattle to tend to in Luke chapter 14, verses uh, 16 through 24. He's the one that talked about the dishonest manager in Luke chapter 16, 1 through 8. He alone is the one in Luke chapter 16 that talked about the rich man and Lazarus. You see, pretty heavy. So Luke, by the Spirit of God, God used him to say, hey, make sure that Christ is first in our lives. Amen? And that means if... We can say, man, you know, I've been blessed with this, but I never go the extra mile to help anyone. There's probably something wrong. Because faith without works is what? Is dead. Now, at the same time, we have to balance that out where don't let anybody say, you need to give, you know, you need to sell your house and give it to this guy over here. Okay, that's shepherding over someone's soul. And you don't know what God is saying to that person. We can give New Testament principles, as Roger did recently, right? About, hey, the scriptures say, give in accordance with what you make. That's to the Lord's work. But you can't specify that this person should give this and this person should give that. We just all need to be faithful to the Lord that call us based on those principles of scripture. Amen? Very, very important to understand. In fact, 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians says, but by an equality, this is pretty heavy, that now at this time your abundance may be in supply for their want, that their abundance may be in supply for your want, that there may be equality. Very interesting. Verse 50, as it is written, he uh, that had gathered much had nothing. Uh, why? And it says, uh, and he that had gathered little had no lack. And a little bit further down, well, think of the ultimate principle. By this we perceive the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. As Christians, our faith is based on the fact that Jesus gave his life for us. Amen? Died, was buried, rose again. We have eternal life. And now we're supposed to lay our lives down for our brethren. And if I could, lay my life, if I could say, yeah, I'd lay my life down for my brother, but I don't help him out when he's in need. I can't spare a buck. I can't buy him a hamburger. There's something wrong with my faith. How can I give my life? 
Okay, so we need to make sure we're not greedy people and that our fellowship is based on trying to love and share one another. Although it's what? It's got to come from the heart. It says in the scripture that we're to give hilariously. That's a, the Greek word actually means hilariously, without grudging. Wow. That's a text that people preach on all the time when they preach on giving. I've never preached on it in my whole life. Probably the first time I quoted it in almost 20 years of pastoring here. But it says we're not supposed to give grudgingly, but hilariously. And I'm not talking about the tithe right now and during the offering. I'm saying just the way we live our lives among our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. God help us. God help us. Amen. How many of you, when you put your tithe in the offering, are all hilarious and excited? It's a time of worship. It is. When I'm worshiping the Lord, you know, when I'm worshiping the Lord, that's an extension of my worship when we give. When Lisa and I tithe, that's an extension of our worship. I had a brother in the fellowship say, you guys shouldn't even tithe because you're like the Levites. You guys live off the ministry. You shouldn't tithe. But I feel like for me, I'm still going to tithe because I feel like I need to do what the rest of the congregation does. And God's going to take care of me, you know? To me, it's not a big deal to rent a house. And I, I rent, I have no savings. But guess what? I've got something going on in heaven, guys. I'm only here for a little while. And so are you. If you put Jesus first, he says, store up, don't store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust do corrupt and thieves break in and steal, but store up your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and thieves don't break in and steal. I'm transferring my stuff to heaven. Amen? And when it all goes down, well done, good and faithful servant. And my ultimate treasure is Jesus. So he says, hey, you know what, Joe? I want you to sleep in a sleeping bag, you know, on this side of the throne. I'll be, praise God, I'm here. Amen? I'll be excited. How about you? The next thing on the list, chapter 4, or chapter 2, verse 42. Chapter 2, verse 42. They were continually devoting them to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. And to the breaking of bread. Most commentators point out here that he's talking primarily about communion because that was a term that was used for communion in the early church period, the breaking of bread. And you might ask, why do we have communion every single Sunday pretty much? Because the early church continually devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And even though they were so close to the cross, it had just happened, Jesus just had died for their sins not too long before this. Guess what? Months, a couple months prior, not even two months, they were still taking communion with one another. And I believe that you don't just need to take communion at church with your brothers and sisters when we corporately gather in a bigger group like today. I believe that it's wise to take communion with your family from time to time, to, to take out some unleavened bread and some cup and, and oh, with dinner maybe you you know you eat your dinner and then you break bread together and maybe you have a short devotion when you have a devotion time with your family i want to encourage you to have communion with your family from time to time but definitely as a fellowship we should be having communion and what's sad is many churches they'll have rarely have communion anymore but the early church con con uh, continually devoted themselves to what the breaking of bread now, I agree with other commentators that say it wasn't just communion, but they ate together, they fellowshiped together, and they were taking their meals together because guess what? It, it's unpacked. That verse gets unpacked in verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and what? Breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their what? Meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. When you have a brother or sister over or a family over, you might have communion with them. And say, hey, can we have communion with you guys? And that's keeping our unity based on Jesus and remembering the cross, remembering that the whole point is the cross, what Jesus did for us, and not forgetting that. That's why every Sunday we have communion, because our focus is Jesus Christ. Amen? And if I was going to have a really, really short service, don't bank on that, but if we were going to, <laughs> we'd still throw communion in there. We still throw communion in there because we try to. And I'm not saying you can never miss communion because we're not going to become legalistic about it. But it has to come out of the heart. Amen? But what happens is the cross gets relegated to no longer central for many people. Or communion, it it's too, takes too much time. Non-believers, they're not going to want to stay there for it. and it, We're not going to grow as fast. Well, guess what, man? We're looking for people who want Jesus. 
And communion focuses on Jesus. Amen? And it's the focal point of what he's done for us. And also underscores our unity. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, it says, it speaks of the spiritual presence, or I should say, the spiritual sense of partaking of Christ. When we partake of communion, there's a spiritual sense in which we partake of Christ. Not like Roman Catholicism, which they believe in transubstantiation, transubstance, the meaning of substance being transformed literally into the wine and the blood and, and the bread and the flesh. By the way, all you have to do is look at the Catholic cup and the bread. It wasn't transformed. It's still wine. It don't taste like blood either. Okay? And it's still, it's still bread. Okay? It's not, there's no hocus pocus magic going on. But there's a way that we're spiritually entering into a dimension of who Christ is as we solemnly focus on what represents his death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, I think it's interesting, it says, The cup of blessing which we bless is, not the, is it not the fellowship of Christ? There's a certain type of fellowship that we have with Christ through that. It's very, very interesting. It says, the bread which we break, is it not the, com- is it not the communion of the body of Christ? There's communion. We're the body of Christ. There's a special communion that goes on with us when we take communion. And if we jettison communion and only have it once in a blue moon or at a special service sometime, how can we have communion the way God calls us to? And how are we devoting ourselves continually to the communion that God calls us to through the breaking of bread. So I think this is very important. A little bit later in that same uh, chapter, it says, For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. You see that underscoring of biblical fellowship. Very, very important. The next verse, chapter 2, verse 42. The last part of that verse, I should say, of verse 42 They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to what? Prayer. This was something the early church was continually devoted to. I want to challenge Blessed Oak Chapel. I want to challenge all believers that are listening to us on CD or by the internet or television that, man, you need to be continually devoted to prayer. You need to pray and pray and continue to pray. The early church prayed, it said, without ceasing. We want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. We're sorry we couldn't bring it to you in its entirety, but you can hear it online in its full content. Uh, Our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. Till next time.